Welcome back to another episode of Principles of Micro. Today we are in Chapter 11, looking at price discrimination. We learned earlier what price discrimination is, and we learned about perfect price discrimination. Next up is second degree price discrimination, also called bundling. So what this means is that you get a discount for buying in bulk. We had an example earlier, but now we'll go into greater depth. You've surely seen something like this before. Buy one, get one 50% off. That's second degree price discrimination. So it's called bundling because when you bundle two goods together, bundle multiple units together, then you get a lower price. We talked about this way back in chapter 16 a little bit. We talked about marginal utility. Remember we said, loosely speaking, this is not entirely precise, but just go with it for now. Loosely speaking, utility was how much happiness you get from consuming. We said that marginal utility is diminishing. So if you have twice as much pizza, you're not going to be twice as happy. The more full you get, the benefit of having extra pizza is going to be smaller and smaller once you're stuffed then having more pizza could actually make you worse off. So because doubling consumption does not make you double as happy then the firms that charge people a lower price in order to get them to buy extra units. So if the math works out just right you can make this happen. You got to offer a discount that's big enough to get people to keep buying more, but this has to be small enough they can still make a profit. Doesn't always work out nicely, but if it can, it can be a win-win for both consumers and the firm. So let's go back to my bag of rice example that I had in our first episode. Maybe our one pound bag costs one dollar. You could also buy a 20 pound bag but it's not going to cost $20. They're going to price discriminate and charge a price of just $10 for that 20 pound bag. So the price per unit is now 50 cents per pound if you buy in bulk. So if you don't care a lot about price, if you're not very price sensitive, you buy the one pound bag because you want to not have the same thing for dinner over and over and over again for the next several months. If instead, if you like what I was like when I was in grad school, you don't have a whole lot of money and you don't mind having dinner planned out for the next three months because you don't have a lot of time to think about this kind of stuff, then you buy a 20 pound bag and you save a bit of money. So you can separate consumers into two different groups based upon their willingness to pay. The person who cares a lot about price, they pay the lower price for the big bag because they don't mind having the same thing over and over again. They just want to have a lower price. The person who cares more about having variety and they are less price sensitive, they pay the higher price. Now I should insert a word of caution here. This often means that the richer consumers pay more and the poorer ones pay less, but not always. What it is really about is the people with the higher willingness to pay end up paying more while people at the lower willingness to pay end up paying less. It's not always the same thing as richer pay more, but it usually does. So be a little careful about that when you're conducting your analysis. So what does bundling mean for social welfare? The first takeaway we have here is that it's going to reduce deadweight loss. So it's going to reduce the inefficiency. So when there's no price discrimination, when everybody pays the same price, then this red triangle here is going to be the deadweight loss. Remember we said earlier that you have to have market power in order to price discriminate. Whenever there's market power, the firm sets marginal revenue, this orange line equal to marginal cost, the green line. That's going to depend on the quantity to produce. Then you plot that quantity on a demand curve. 
shown here in blue, that tells you the price you're going to charge. So the consumer is willing to pay is given approximately by our demand curve. So the way to pay up here for the price they actually pay is just around 75. So this purple triangle is the consumer's benefit, consumer surplus. For the producer, their surplus, the gap between the price they collect, 75, and the marginal cost. Marginal cost is down here, this green line. So you get this blue region of producer surplus. Unfortunately, this red region here is deadweight loss. These transactions could have benefited both sides. The consumer just wants to pay, given by a demand curve, exceeds the marginal cost, the green line. So if those trades would have benefited both sides, why didn't they happen? Well, to make those trades happen, the firm would have to lower price. If the firm lowers price, that's going to cut into their revenue on all these other units they sold over here. And overall, it would have reduced their profits. They don't want that. So there's going to be some inefficiency when there is no price discrimination. Now suppose instead we can price discriminate. So the folks who have a high ones to pay, we charge them $80. So there was the pay given by their demand curve. That's going to be up here. The gap between that and the price of 80 is their surplus, this purple triangle. For the firm, their producer surplus is going to be the gap between the price and the marginal cost. That will be this big blue region down here. Now that price of 80 is not going to be affordable or not desirable for all consumers. Some folks have a lower price to pay, so we charge them just 70. So their price to pay is down here. The price is 70, so the gap between that and price is their consumer surplus, so the second purple triangle. For the producer, their additional producer surplus is the gap between the price of 70 and their marginal cost down here. So that'd be the second blue region. As you can see, we divide consumers into these separate groups. That's going to cause that deadweight loss region to shrink. That red deadweight loss is smaller here than it was before. Thus, overall, social welfare has gone up. Now let's explore what it implies for the individual components of social welfare. So the first result is that producer surplus will unambiguously rise. The firms have to have price setting power. We said that back in our first episode. So the firm has the ability to set price that the choice to price discriminate like this, or they could not price discriminate. They wouldn't price discriminate unless it made them better off. If price discrimination was bad for firms, firms would not do it. So producer surplus has to rise. Now for consumer surplus, we can establish that some consumers are better off from this. This is in contrast to a result when you had first degree or perfect price discrimination. So perfect price discrimination eliminates consumer surplus entirely, second degree or bundling does not do that. Secondary price discrimination can benefit some consumers. So you can verify that on our graph over here. When there was no price discrimination, everyone faced the same price of 75. Some consumers though said that $75 is too expensive for us. We're not willing to pay. The price is gonna be 75. However, if you can price discriminate, you can charge those folks a price of 70, and now they're willing to buy. So you're willing to pay a 75, but your personalized price is 70. Now you're going to get a $5 consumer surplus. 
earlier when you had a Fireside 75, then you don't buy and you get no benefit. So those consumers who have a low willingness to pay are better off when price discrimination is possible. Now some consumers are worse off. Before everyone faced the same price of $75, some people over here had a willingness to pay as high as $100. So they got a $25 consumer surplus when they paid 75 when they're willing to pay 100. But now we charge those folks a higher price. They're paying 80 now instead of 75. Therefore, people that high ones to pay are worse off because they're paying more now. The consumers who had the low ones to pay are better off because we're charging them less. So it's a mixed effect on consumer surplus. Some consumers benefit, some consumers are worse off. So what is the net effect? We'll look at a couple examples. So big question up here is, can consumer surplus go up when there is bundling? In this example, your book focuses on what it means for the firm's producer surplus, but I want to focus on what it means for consumer surplus. So work through that when you're solving this problem. So here's case one. In this case, the firm charges everyone the same price of 300 and we sell 100 units. The book here is showing the firm's producer surplus, but again, I want you guys to find consumer surplus. So find that, then compare that to what's happening in case two. So in case two, we're gonna sell 50 units at a price of $400. Again, your book shows the producer surplus, but I want you guys to find consumer surplus. Then we'll also have a price of 200 down here. I'm gonna sell an extra 100 units by doing that. So ignore this, go ahead and find the consumer surplus in that case. Then figure out in which scenario is consumer surplus bigger. Is it bigger in the case when there is price discrimination or is it bigger when there is no price discrimination? So I'll go ahead and pause the video here and calculate that before continuing. All right, I'll presume you have worked through the problem by now, so let's go and look at the answer. So look at case one first. That's when there is no price discrimination. So it's been the same price of $300. So you find consumer surplus by finding a gap between that price and a consumer is willing to pay. That's their demand curve. So all the area below demand and above that price of 300. So you get this purple triangle over here. So the area of that triangle is given by just the usual formula, base times height over two. So our base is 100. Our height is 200. Gap between 500 and 300 is 200. So you got 100 times 200 over two, that comes out to 10,000. So that's the outcome when there is no price discrimination. Consumer surplus will be $10,000. So now I'll look at consumer surplus when there is price discrimination and see which one's gonna be bigger overall. So our first group, we said was gonna pay a price of 400. People the biggest ones to pay end up paying the biggest price. And we sell them 50 units. So we look at the gap between the price they pay of 400 and the price they're willing to pay given by our demand curve. That gives us our first purple triangle up here. And then we look at the second group. 
and they're going to pay a price of $200 and they buy 100 units. So what's their consumer surplus? That's the gap between the price of 200 and what they're willing to pay over here. So it's going to be the second purple triangle. So we find the area of each purple triangle and that's going to tell us what total, what consumer surplus is going to be. So for our first one, the base was 50 and the height was 100. So you take 50 times 100 and you divide that by 2. That works out to 2,500. For the second group, the height's going to be 200. The base will be 100. 150 minus 50 is going to be 100. That's how I know base is going to be 100. So we take 200 times 100 and we divide that by 2. That comes out to 10,000. So for total consumer surplus, you add that 10,000 for the second triangle to the 2,500 we had for our first triangle. Total is going to be 12,500. Now, on the last slide, we showed that when there was no price discrimination, consumer surplus was just 10,000. When there is price discrimination, now it's 12,500. That means that overall, consumer surplus went up when there was second degree price discrimination. So unlike first degree price discrimination, price discrimination, second degree price discrimination can actually improve consumer welfare. Now, the other possibility is that bundling or second degree price discrimination can also lower consumer surplus. Here's how I can see that. So let's say you divide consumers into two groups. We saw that diagram earlier over here. So you have this consumer surplus up here and you have that consumer surplus down here. You know, this little debit loss, red triangle. But what if you found a way to divide consumers into three groups? That could look more like this. We can draw a diagram for Webacy divide them into four groups, Webacy divide them into five groups, etc., etc. As you keep doing that, your graph is going to start looking more and more like this one. It's going to start approaching first degree price discrimination. And we know when there's first degree price discrimination, then there's no consumer surplus at all. So sometimes bundling can improve consumer surplus. But if you can divide consumers into many, many different groups, it starts to look like first degree price discrimination, and we know that's going to lower consumer surplus. So our big takeaway for second degree price discrimination and welfare is that social welfare will rise. That's because that weight loss falls. Producer surplus will rise. Consumer surplus might rise or it might fall. It depends. So that's summarizing what I just said in words. So that wraps up our section on second degree price discrimination. Be sure to join us for our next episode, which will look at third degree price discrimination.